<coughs> Hi folks, hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. Love to everybody. My website is jasonburnspreacher.com. You can get me on Facebook and Twitter. And we're looking at the doctrine of annihilationism, a heresy uh, taught by many people today and accepted by evangelical leaders as an equal view to the traditional view and biblical view, orthodox view of hell. I'm doing this series, a long series, because it's a doctrine that has infiltrated the church and I believe that we need to make a stand against it. And I'm doing it in the best scholarly way I can <coughs> by showing you uh, what a scholar <coughs> and scholars are teaching on this view <coughs> excuse me and then tackling them in, in a fair way so we've looked at in this the other video about the Old Testament passages and that Edward Fudge and annihilationist principally use the mainly the Old Testament and whenever they do go to the New Testament they will always invariably make the Old Testament their ultimate authority. And they will use the Old Testament to water down any signs of a traditional doctrine of hell in the New Testament. <coughs> and we've looked at some pertinent questions. Where is the chronology within these texts of the Old Testament of annihilationism? The 4-4 chronology of death, death, uh, resurrection, judgment, and then annihilationism. We've looked at also, do the annihilationists understand the Old Testament in progressive revelation or linear revelation? And the Old Testament is quite clearly uh, progressive revelation. And then <clears throat> we're going to look at a few other caveats. We looked at a caveat, <coughs> the issue of justice, that people will still be going for thousands of years, even in the time of Abraham today. Uh, suffering before they even become annihilated. So that undermines annihilationism. But a couple of more caveats. Paul talks, I think it's in... Uh, I think it's in 2 Corinthians 10. <coughs> or 1 Corinthians... 1 Corinthians 10. So 1 Corinthians 10, sorry about that. 1 Corinthians 10, it says... For we being many are one bread and one body. Behold, Israel after the flesh are not. So it is Israel chapter one. Uh, Israel one Corinthians. Uh, sorry, Israel. One Corinthians chapter ten, verse nineteen. What then, that the idol anything? Sorry. Sorry about this. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, sorry about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant, how that all the fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea, and did all ate the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. <coughs> so the other caveat as well, when... The annihilationist says that the Old Testament teaches annihilation. It kind of, <coughs> excuse me, it kind of um, doesn't realise as well that the Old Testament, even though you have these literal things about uh, death, is teaching about eternal sp <coughs> spiritual realities. So you can't just take it in a, a full literal flat sense because the Old Testament are types about eternity and uh, uh, for example Christ um, the other issue as well is if people are annihilated there is a passage where it talks about Jesus descending into hell and preaching to people right so if the annihilationists uh, are saying that annihilation is in, in the Old Testament where did the people come from who were in hell when Jesus goes to preach to them and when he died? So those are some issues about the Old Testament. <clears throat> um, the next point with Edward Fudge um, is he then goes into um, 
looking at various literature outside the Bible, such as the Apocrypha, <coughs> uh, and um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, rabbinical views, etc. Uh, <clears throat> I would say that <coughs> excuse me, there's a, a pick and mix going on when we're looking at sorry <coughs> when we're looking at uh, these ancient writings uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, apocryphal writings <coughs> people are picking and mixing because you can find literature that gives a different point of view that there is the doctrine of hell in early Judaism so for example uh, there are passages in the Maccabees um, so uh, Specific facts. <coughs> Sorry about this. Uh, yeah, so for example, <coughs> scholars can quote for annihilationism the wisdom of Solomon, uh, sixteen, thirteen. To four, so William Barclay would quote uh, the wisdom of Solomon. All right, so you can look at uh, ancient literature and say, "Oh, it, uh, the Jews in the time of Jesus and before Jesus didn't believe in the doctrine of hell." Right, and you can quote things like wisdom of Solomon, <clears throat> but you can also quote four Mac Maccabees, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen, which talks about hell is torture. Right, <clears throat> so. Be careful when, in debates and when you're talking to uh, annihilationists, when they start quoting uh, things from church history and from ancient literature saying that there was the doctrine of annihilation there, they're only picking and choosing the bits of information they want to relate to you. There's lots of other information that would actually contradict what they're saying, so you've got to be careful. All right? And they can seem very plausible uh, in their argument. So, so that's the issue concerning um, <clears throat> that's the issue concerning uh, ancient writings, the rabbinical writings, Dead Sea Scrolls, Apocrypha, etc. He then, Edward Fudge then goes on and talks about John the Baptist. <coughs> he says, uh, Matthew 3, 11, 12 doesn't mean eternal. Uh, again, he goes into expounding John the Baptist's doctrine of hell. He spends a whole time circling around Old Testament passages like Jeremiah 17, 27, Ezekiel 20, 47, 48, Amos 5, Six, and he uses the Old Testament to deconstruct John the Baptist. The same he goes with uh, the Lord Jesus when uh, it says in Matthew 10, 28, <clears throat> he talks about Gehenna, and then his main passage is John three sixteen, where he talks about... <coughs> uh, so let's go to John three sixteen. <clears throat> so... <coughs> excuse me, John 3... 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him, on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So he'll say, shall not perish, shall have everlasting life. Now I've got <coughs> William Hendrickson here, so let's go to William Hendrickson. I don't know what Hendrickson is going to say, but let, uh, let's have a look at John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God infinite love made manifest in an infinitely glorious manner. This is the theme of the golden text which endeared itself to the hearts of all God's children. The verse sheds light on the following aspects of this. The character so loved, the author God, its object the world, the gift the Son, the only begotten, its purpose that whoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. The conjunction for establish establishes a causal relationship between this and the preceding verse. We might paraphrase as follows. The fact 
that it is only in connection with Christ that everlasting life is ever obtained. It is clear from this that it has pleased God to grant this supreme gift only to those who repose their trust in him. Its character, the word, so by reason of what follows, must be interpreted as indicating in such an infinite degree as in such transcendentally glorious manner great emphasis is placed on this thought. So love, the tense used in this original shows that God's love in action, reaching back to eternity and coming to fruition in Bethlehem and at Calvary, is received as one great central fact that love was rich and true, full understanding, tenderness and majesty, its author. <clears throat> so love God with the article in the original, where has been shown the Father is indicated. In order to gain some conception of deity, it will never do to subtract from the popular concept every possible attribute until literally nothing is left. God is ever full of life. Its object, the object of this love, is the world. The words that whoever believes clearly indicates that the reference is not to birds or trees but to mankind. However here mankind is not viewed as the realm of evil breaking out into open hostility to God and Christ, for God does not love evil. <clears throat> the term world as here used must mean mankind, which though sin laid and exposed to the judgment and need of salvation, is still the object of his care. God's image is still, to a degree, reflected in the children of men. Mankind is like a mirror. Originally this mirror was very beautiful, a work of art. So he goes on, its purpose. <clears throat> Here it is. The words should not perish do not merely mean should not lose physical existence, nor do they signify should not be annihilated as the context of verse 17 indicates. So let's look at verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. <clears throat> so let's see. As the context verse 17, the perishing of the of which this verse speaks indicates divine condemnation complete and everlasting for God <clears throat> sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved so there's a condemnation there how can you be condemned if you don't exist <clears throat> as the context indicates the perishing of which this verse speaks indicates divine condemnation complete and everlasting so that one is banished from the presence of the God of, of love and dwells forever in the presence of God of wrath, a condition which in principle begins here and now, but does not reach its full terrible culmination for both soul and body until the day of the great consummation. Note that perishing is the antinome of having everlasting life, but have everlasting life. The life which pertains to the future age, to the realm of glory, becomes the possession of the believer here and now. This is in principle... This life is salvation manifest itself in the fellowship with God in Christ. In partaking of the love of God, of his peace and of his joy. The adjective everlasting occurs seven times in the fourth gospel, six times in 1 John, always with the noun life. It indicates, as being pointed out, a life that is different in quality from the life which characterised the present age. However, the noun with its adjective is used here as a quantitative connotation it is actually everlasting never ending life in order to receive everlasting life one must believe in God's only begotten son so Hendrickson does not see that passage as teaching annihilationism so John 3 16 Hendrickson one of the great Bible commentators for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So the everlasting life is eternal, but it's qualitative. So, um, so I, I want to just look at a passage. Um, I've got some notes here. So is, is that a fair comment, what he's saying there? So let, let, let's... 
I've got uh, some notes. See what's here. Just see what's here. Yeah, if you turn to John three thirty six, so in, in in the same chapter, John three thirty six. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Which is the wrath of God abides, meno, which means to remain. And you can look at John 1 32, John 5 38, 1 Peter 1 2 2 5, John 15 10. All of these have the idea of meno, abide, it means stayed upon, continual. It doesn't mean annihilation. So that's in John, um, John 3.36. So in that same chapter, you know, you've got passages, a passage that clarifies, clarifies the position. Okay, so if we go back to John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The annihilation said perish means annihilation there. Hendrickson says no, it means continual perish as in hell. But then we go to John chapter 3 verse 36 he that believeth on him, the Son of everlasting life, he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So it, it's not just eternal, it's a quality of life. And the quality is you either have the life of God, the blessing of God, or the curse of God, the wrath of God, abides. All right? And it's not abide as in uh, annihilate, it's abide as in stayed upon. The wrath stays upon you. So if you you have to be alive for it to stay upon you. Okay. So that passage, John 3.16, is a main annihilist in this passage. And I've given you a possible way of dealing with dealing with that. So two, yeah. So then Fudge goes on uh, to talk about the word destroy means uh, kill, murder. So, uh, for example, Matthew 22, 7, troops sent to destroy. Um, so he's saying the words destroy, perish, mean what they say, um, which means... Um, they're annihilated. He says those words mean annihilated. Uh, on the Greek word destroy, uh, if you look at Thea, um, which uh, just 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 to get get a feel for this. So you know, if you if you go to uh, Matthew twenty five. No, sorry, if we go to Matthew 10, a passage that annihilationists use, Fudge uses it. So if we go to Matthew 10, uh, verse 28, it says, And fear not them that kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So the word destroy there, Fudge would interpret as annihilationism. Now, 
I did some research on the word destroy and, on, and on this passage, right? And I'm going to be intellectually honest, right? But I did a lot of research on the word destroy and this passage. And uh, a few passages do talk about the word destroy means kill. So you have Luke chapter 6 verse 9. Uh, Mark chapter 124 so we have to be fair to the annihilationist there are verses that show that um, the word destroy can mean kill as in annihilate so right but the interesting thing is 95% of the of the commentators that I looked at and I looked at about 15 maybe 20 commentators modern and old only one or two believed that this passage taught annihilationism. Matthew Henry, Matthew Poole, um, John Gill, uh, Robertson, um, all the great commentators believed it taught hell. Right? But Thayer says that the word means a variety of things. It can mean put put away entirely, abolish, to ruin, render useless, put to death, eternal misery. So Thayer is a, was an expert in Greek uh, with his concordance. So the weight, the weight of scholarship doesn't interpret the word destroy as in annihilate from what I've seen looking at some of the passages it's easy to take some of the passages that do mean kill and then say well and you know it's a strong argument I'm not saying it's not a valid argument it's a strong argument say so, look when it says do not fear the man who can kill the body but fear God who can kill the body soul in hell, destroy the body soul in hell there are a few passages that use the word destroy meaning kill so it would it would be a strong argument to make from the um, annihilation to say that that passage means annihilation, right? But the word destroy from Thea can have a variety of meanings. And the weight of scholarship, the weight of commentators, seems to suggest that they have interpreted it to mean eternal destroy it means eternal eternal damnation okay in, in hell so that that is, so that is the my honest look at that passage so far and the conclusion there is that is the main passage to prove annihilationism from the new testament but if that's the case it's not conclusive You know, it can be shown to not be conclusive. So they can't use that as the main main passage because it, it is not conclusive. There are words that use destroy that don't mean kill. All right. So if that's the case, you know, the context declares, shows the situation and then wider theological discussion of the Bible. To me, I think it's clear. I think it is clear. Uh, it is showing, uh, I think, personally, from just reading the context, that in hell means a place, that your, your body and soul go to a place. And destroy means, you know, eternal shame. Um, Yeah, so, so that, that's uh, two of the main passages that we've looked at, really. Uh, fudge. So we've looked at Fudge. Just getting that, sorry. So we'll go on to the next video. So 
What we've done here in this video, we've looked at two key passages, John 3.16 and we've looked at uh, Matthew chapter uh, 10 verse 28. These are two key passages. In fact, we'll now go to uh, William Hendrickson. Again, and we'll look at Matthew. We've looked at Hendrickson on John. Now we'll look at Hendrickson on Matthew. So let's go to uh, Matthew 10, 10, uh, 28. Now don't forget, don't forget that this passage, these passages that we've just looked at are the primary two column passages, two powerful passages that the annihilationists try to use to, to say that, that to teach annihilationism. Okay? So let's just look at these passages. It says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. Wherever the enemies may wish to do, there is one thing they cannot do, namely kill the psyche, that is the soul, the part of man which is immaterial and invisible. As the distinction in the biblical usage between psyche, soul, and penuma for my book, The Bible, Life Hereafter. Nowhere does scripture teach that man is compared to three parts. Read Genesis 2 7. And you will notice that in the story of man's creation, his twofold nature is clearly asserted. A long list of passages could be given to indicate that the inspired authors of the Bible were dichotomous. The list would include such passages as Ecclesiastes 12 7. Matthew 10, 28, Romans 10, 8, 10, etc. There is only one immaterial and invisible element, though at least two names are given to it. Now it is true that the Bible is referring to that immaterial element in its relation to the body, to bodily process and sensations, and in fact to this entire earthly life with its feelings, affections, likes and dislikes. It generally employs the term soul, psyche, for example, the Jews stirred up the souls of the Gentiles, Acts 14, 2. It's also true that were references to the same immaterial element considered as the object of God's grace, as the subject of worship, the term spirit is used most frequently, always in Paul, when the meaning is intended. For example, my spirit prays, 1 Corinthians 14, 14. But the matter is by no means as simple as that. In several instances, the two terms, soul and spirit, are used interchangeably with no or very slight difference in connotation. So he's going on about uh, soul. I'll keep reading. The conclusion therefore is this, when you are talking about man's invisible and immaterial element, you have a perfect right to call it either soul or spirit. And if anyone is speaking to you, you should maintain that man's soul is necessarily his lower immaterial substance, not merely as valuable as his spirit. You might ask him whether he does not believe in soul winning, whether he does not also believe that his soul is saved, and whether he does not agree that it were better for a man to forfeit the whole world and not lose his soul, when you have made your point clear, suggest to him that he and you sing the hymn, O oh my soul, bless thou Jehovah. So I'll just keep reading. He says, Jesus then is warning against the tragic error of being constantly filled with fear because of those who are able to kill the body, as if the body were more important than the soul. He continues, rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. It is hardly necessary to add that the pronoun of him refers to God. By omitting the noun itself, more emphasis is placed upon God's character and activity, that is, upon whatever he is and what he is able to do. The word destroy is used here. Here's the key. Here's the key. The word destroy is used here, the sense not of annihilation, but of the infliction of of everlasting punishment upon a person as to the world hell which here in the original Gehenna so he, let's read that again the word destroy is used here in the sense not of annihilation but of afflict, inflicting of everlasting punishment upon a person Matthew 25 46 Mark 9 49 2 Thessalonians 1 9 as to the word hell which here in the original is Gehenna see also Matthew 5 22 29 Matthew 18, 9, 
uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 43, 47, Luke 12, 5, James 3, 6. It generally refers to the abode of the wicked body and soul after the judgment day. When that same abode is called Hades, the reference is to the time before the judgment day, though Hades also has other meanings in scripture. Jesus then is saying that there is an everlasting future for both soul and body. Neither will ever be annihilated, but everlasting destruction is the store of those who reject him. The attempt to save the body so that it may continue to exist here and now for a brief span of time while the everlasting interests of the entire person and body are being neglected is foolish, indeed like exchanging a minor for a major pearl. See Luke 12, 13, 21. By proclaiming the message of the kingdom courageously, the disciples receive the assurance of everlasting life to the glory of God. In the addition, there will be a blessing to the fellow men. Let them stand in awe of God. Let them revere him in whose hands they themselves with soul and body of everlasting secure. Let them not be scared of earthly opponents who can accomplish so very little. So again, another great commentator, William Hendricks, is saying this passage that Mark, Matthew, 28, uh, Matthew 10, 28, which an annihilation, annihilation is used to say, that people are annihilated. This great commentator says it doesn't teach annihilationism, but it teaches eternal hell. So, so far, we've looked at the Old Testament, how they use it. Now we've looked at two of their main pillars, the annihilationist pillars, okay? And we've looked at getting the context of the passages in the context, the, the John passage, further down in the chapter. And then looking at the etymology of the Greek and the variety of Greek statements, we've seen that the passage in John cannot be taken as annihilationism because of the wider passage. And the passage in, um, in Matthew... Looking at the Greek, you cannot with certainty say that it means annihilation, but there are other various meanings of the word destroy. But as we see, the weight of scholarship goes with the idea that it means hell. And we've looked at uh, Matthew Henry, uh, not Matthew Henry, uh, William Hendrickson, uh, who, who states that. So now we're just going to brush up in the next... next uh, <coughs> In the next passage, we're going to, in the next uh, video, we're going to look at <coughs> some um, some some more arguments for the traditional view of hell, the doctrine of hell, and we're going to just round off in the next video. All right, God bless you and take care.